Good morning. Good morning. I wish you each a blessed rest in Christ. That's what the word Sabbath means, rest. In Hebrew, it spells Shabbat. In English, it's spelled R-E-S-T. This morning, we be... I didn't even turn this on. Okay. You learn not to trust me. This morning we begin a new quarter. This morning we begin studying a new quarter. We've been studying it for this past week. If you have a quarterly, does everyone have a quarterly? Okay. studying this quarter? Galatians. Galatians. Galatians is a monumental message. A monumental message. Circumstantially, 100% wrong. The book of Galatians was God's idea through history to prepare people based on the historical period of time that they were living in and to move them forward to the end of time. It was impossible for Luther to understand the end time aspect of Galatians. Not because of lack of intellect or education, but because of the circumstance of timing. God, in his wisdom, gave the prophet Daniel an overall picture of the history of this world. It's called a 2300 year prophecy. The first part of that prophecy we know as the 70 week prophecy or the 490 year prophecy which began after the third letter of approval to rebuild Jerusalem was put forward. Years ago, I began to understand, <coughs> not know, I knew it, but I did understand it, the significance of this time prophecy. I'm going to attempt to hold this up. Some of you may be familiar with this prophecy. The first letter of approval was issued in 538-537 AD by Cyrus, who had conquered Babylon. God impressed Cyrus. God speaks of Cyrus in the Bible. He inspired Isaiah in chapter 44 and 45 of Isaiah to predict that this guy by the name of Cyrus 
was going to come down the road of time 150 years before he was born. Does that impress you? Yes. Does God know exactly what to do when the right time has come to do it? Yes. It's important for us to understand that, folks. Because if you don't understand God's compass, you're going to be wandering in the wilderness until you do. So, then another guy came along, Darius, in 519, and he duplicated the authority for Israel to have the right to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Then, a very, very clever politician and military leader by the name of Artaxerxes came into the picture in 457 B.C. And he wrote a third approval letter which was implemented. That's when the clock began to tick. Because action took place. That's when we start measuring time, don't we? When something starts to happen. So the two previous players, Cyrus and Darius, were inspired by God, but now Artaxerxes says, this is happening now. So that's when the clock begins to tick. So, that was in uh, 457. Then uh, 49 uh, years later, the restoration of Jerusalem was completed, 408. B.C. And then, that prophecy, which we, some people call the 1490 year prophecy, or the 70 week prophecy, was fulfilled in 34 A.D. when the gospel went out to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Okay? Now, when did Luther come into the picture? He was born in 1483 and died in 1546. So it was historically and circumstantially impossible for him to understand the end time aspect and understanding of the book that we're studying this quarter. It had nothing to do with intelligence or education. It had to do with circumstances. So if you hear anyone say, well, this is a rerun of what Luther understand, understood. Don't say anything to them. Just ask God. When God feels that it's appropriate for this person, if this person is receptive, to share with them that it was historically and circumstantially impossible for Luther to understand the end time aspect of the gospel. Specifically in the books of Galatians and Romans. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I'm not knocking Luther, but there's a reason why these people say that this is a rerun or rediscovery of what Luther. In other words, what we have is a rediscovery or a rerun of what Luther gave us. Is there a problem? No. Okay. <coughs> Question. Can I just comment? No, no, just comment on the fact that that's what Daniel 12, 4 is, is the point that you're making. Okay. You know, a lot of people use that to say, oh, we're in airplanes and all this stupid stuff, but that's not it at all. It's exactly what you're saying. Okay. So, once we understand this, then we understand that not only understand, but appreciate. Something that I'm going to read to you. God raised a couple of ministers in the 1800s, Seventh-day Adventist ministers, and he gave them an understanding, the gospel aspect understanding of the books of Galatians and Romans. One of these men was a physician by training. And he wrote a word-by-word -word explanation of the book of Galatians and Romans. We do
do not accept those books today because these two men were attacked so viciously by the administration of this church that one of the founders of the church said, you have treated these men like the Jews treated Jesus when he was here. Those are her words. And it's very possible that these two men will lose complete confidence in the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and leave it. And they did. So we do, we kind of keep what they wrote kind of hush hush. She also said, if these men leave the church, that will in no way mean that what God impressed them to write was not correct. Amen. Let me read it to you. Quote from Ellen G. White's writings on 1888 message. The message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. Continuing, that was that is found, and that's just one sentence of an entire section from page 1052 to page 1141, written in 1893. Another statement, complementing what she had said in 1893. The Lord, who? The Lord has raised up Brother Jones and Brother Wagner to proclaim a message to the world to prepare people to stand in the day of God. What did we study last quarter, the last two lessons? The day of God. Remember 2 Peter chapter 3? Verse 16. For those that think that Galatians, in our understanding of it, is a rerun or rediscover. By the way, what does the when you see a word that has two letters R E in front of it, what does that mean? When you go to your beautician and you come home and you take a look at yourself in the mirror, a real close look, and you don't like what you did, what do you do? You go back and you say you need to re what do it. My hair. Right? My wife and I bought a home here in an Edgewater. And uh, Built in 1991, so we decided to renovate it, <laughs> redo it. So that's what RE in front of a word means. Something that's already happened, but it needs some what? Touch up work. Let me read to you to see if this is a rerun or rediscovery. We claim God has given us light in the right time. And now we should receive the truth of God, receive it as of heavenly origin. What does the word origin mean? This has been done before, but we're going to redo it. What does the word origin mean? The beginning of something. The start of something. Now, I don't want to get into a controversy if we start a new order, but it's very important that you be aware of where we're at today. You'd like to know where we're at today? I may regret doing this. <laughs> today, it is commonly believed among us <clears throat> that Galatians and Romans, as it was presented to us in 1888, is a rerun of what Luther presented. And I'm going to read to you word for word what the former historian of our church wrote about the 1888 understanding of Galatians and Romans. This is word for word, the former historian is now retired. Quote, the importance of the 1888 message was not some special Adventist doctrine of justification by faith developed by Jones and Wagner. 
rather. It was the reuniting of Adventism with basic Christian beliefs on salvation. Another couple of sentences. Is it true, as some have claimed, that the 1888 message of righteousness by faith is a unique Adventist message? Answer. Whatever the message was, Paul, Luther, and Wesley shared and preached it. That's where we're at today. What we're going to study these 14 weeks, it's unusual to have 14 weeks in a quarter, but today is July what? 14 weeks, we're going to study the book of Galatians. And we today are going to study how and why Jesus recruited Saul, who later on chose to be called Paul, to be the evangelist to the Gentiles, actually to the known world at that time. That's what we're studying this week. Okay? God's original plan was for the nation of Israel to proclaim the gospel to the known world. After the 17 week prophecy or 490 year prophecy had been fulfilled, which I just showed you from Scripture. We're going to go back to Scripture and review that. However, what happened? The nation of Israel rejected their Messiah, even though God gave them very specific benchmarks through history to recognize when He would come. And what he would be like. Do you like the book of Psalms? Yes. Yeah. I love the book of Psalms. God inspired the psalmist David to write chapters 22 and 69. Specifically addressing how can you recognize this person called the Messiah. And in chapter 53 of Isaiah, he really zeroes in where he even describes his appearance. So there is no way that if you can read and you're looking at history, which they were, because Israel waited for the Messiah for how long? 1,500 years approximately. And God gave them specific guidelines when you can start looking for it and what, how you can identify it. 20 your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to read three verses. Daniel chapter 9. When you're there, say ready. And I'm going to read to you. In fact, why don't we have a volunteer read for us? Daniel chapter 9, beginning with verse 24 and 27. Who would like to volunteer to read that for us? Who is willing to... Read it in a volume that everyone can hear. No volunteers? <laughs> Over here, Pat. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your own sake. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand from me. Excuse me. From the going forth to the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and then walk. And the wall, even the tr in the troublesome times. Stop right there. How much is seven and sixty-two added together? Sixty-nine. We're talking about the what? Seventy what? Prophecy. We prophecy for four hundred ninety years. Please continue. Verse 28. And six. after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for Who? himself. Messiah. Messiah. Any mystery here? No okay. mystery at all. It's spelled it right out. Messiah. <clears throat> Give you the time and, <coughs> and how to identify him by his appearance and his behavior. Okay, keep going, please. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
the end of it shall be with flood, until the end of war of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, we have how many weeks so far? Sixty-two and seven is what? And we're talking about the seventy week prophecy. And now we have one week left. Here we go. Then he shall confirm a covenant for many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. When? The middle of the week. The end of the week or the middle of the week? The middle. He's going to bring an end to what? Any mystery here? And he shall, excuse me, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. On the way of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. Even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. Thank you. Does God ever surprise us? Does God ever allow us to be tempted before preparing us for the temptation? Here we have a major event in history that God has prepared us for. When did, when did God start preparing these people? Does your Bible include the book of Deuteronomy? I'm going to read to you real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning with verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Verse 7. The Lord did not set His love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. In those days, power was determined by what? Bodies. So what does God do? He chooses the most unlikely people that anyone would choose to do anything for Him. Why? Because He wants to prove how terrific He is and not how terrific we are. Does that make sense? Okay. Verse 8. Continue the sentence. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. Who's that? Abraham. Yes, <clears throat> the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Is there any misunderstanding of what's happening here? What, what God inspired Moses to record in Deuteronomy? Israel was in slavery for 430 years. And now God is reminding them through Moses what he has done for them. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and cherish his promises. That's what the word keep means. 10. But repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall cherish the commandments or the promises of God and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. That's when all of this began. After he brought them out of what? Out of Egypt. That was approximately 2500 B.C. I mean, from the time of creation to that time, it was approximately 2500 years. That's when the book of uh, the five books of the Old Testament, the first five books were written. So it is very clear that God has a plan. And He's given us time pictures and circumstances and events so that we can follow along where God's plan is at. Depending, of course, on what? Whether we cooperate. Was it God's will for Israel to be taken captive for 70 years? God wanted for them to prepare Jesus' first coming, them being the Israelites that He brought out of Egypt, and He was going to give the land of Canaan to. He wanted to prepare them for Jesus to come after He had brought them out of Egypt and gave them the land of Canaan. That's when God... Wanting for Jesus to come. Was it God's will for Israel to be captive for 70 years? No, he sent 12 minor prophets. To say, what are you doing? 
You're not cooperating with me. Folks, I'm spending this time with this issue because it is an issue for us today. We do not want to repeat poor choices and decisions of our brothers and sisters in the past. Amen. God, however, did not reject Israel after they crucified Jesus. Did he? No. And he predicted that. Jesus was crucified approximately 31 A.D. And the 70 week prophecy does not end until 34 A.D. But when the Jewish nation council, the Sanhedrin, rejected the gospel, Amen. now, this is really serious. They rejected, they crucified Jesus. God did not destroy them. But when they rejected the gospel by stoning Stephen in 34 AD, then God rejected them as a nation. And Jesus predicted that in Matthew 23, 38, when he says, I leave you house unto you what? That's yes. it. Now please do not misunderstand what I'm saying here. Or what God is trying to communicate to us. Yes, God rejected Israel as a nation, as a body that he wanted to evangelize the world. But he did not reject any individual Israelite, even of the Jewish faith, that chose to come to him. Amen. Who would like to volunteer to read John 6, 37? It is crucial that we understand this. John 6, 37. This is Jesus speaking. Who would like to read that? John, okay. Diane. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Thank you. Do we get that? Yes, God rejected Israel as his vehicle to evangelize the world, but no member of the human race, including Israelites of the Jewish faith, would ever be rejected if they chose to accept Jesus. <laughs> as the Messiah. So, after stoning Stephen to death, a great persecution came upon the Christians. One of the participants, by consent, by consent, that participated in the stoning of Stephen, is the author of the book that we're going to study for the next 14 weeks. That should arouse your curiosity just a little bit. Yep. <laughs> Why would the author of the book that we're going to study for the four, next 14 weeks consent to stoning Stephen to death? Let's go to our first scripture. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And I need a volunteer. Acts chapter 6. <clears throat> Beginning with, not verse 9, but with verse 8 through 15. Okay, right, please. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertarians, and the Syrians and the Alexandrians, <coughs> and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Okay, hang on right there. Cyrene is a port city in North Africa. Alexandria is a port city in Egypt. And Cilicia is a coast town in Asia Minor, very close to Saul's hometown. And what was Paul's hometown? Tarsus. Okay, just for a little geography so you know what we're talking about here. Okay, please continue. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they, then they sub, suborned men. Stop. I don't know if that was suborned. They stirred up. Okay. 
men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the...